Good evening, everybody. Good evening. We only have only have one group at home right now, but good evening to you as well, and uh, and welcome. This now is the twelfth installment. We'll have fourteen installments. That means the next two weeks, and then we'll get to our our summer recess. So, looking forward to that. But today's sort of a change of pace um, in in the text that we encounter in the Bible. Um, there's there's going to be a decided sea change, if you will. And you'll, you'll see evidence of that very obviously. But the same things that uh, I've mentioned before for our Zoom users at home, um, thank you for being muted now. Um, but if you have questions, please unmute. And, and Or if you have comments, please uh, chime up, chime in. Um, you're more than welcome to do so. All righty. Uh, we should begin as we always do. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we've been seeing Abraham and Sarah live their lives, lives of faith. They've not been perfect. They've made their mistakes, but they've, they've done their best to follow the guidance that you have given them, and they have traveled faithfully through their lives. Lord God, hold them up as examples for us. May we, too, work, walk through our lives faithfully, knowing that we may err from time to time, but you always, you always welcome us back. You are always our God and you always lead us, even when we have failed or backslid. So, Lord God, we thank you for being with us, for inspiring us, and for leading us, for forgiving us, and for loving us as we are and as we are the people that you have created us to be. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And give me just a second here because I'm going to double check that I'm really recording and I am. That's good. I have done that. Okay. So last time um, we had some interesting things to deal with. Um, things happen in rapid fire fashion, in fact, and sometimes only briefly described. So we found the phrase, the Lord dealt um, as he had promised with regard to Sarah, that is the long awaited son that she had prayed for and fretted over and schemed to have on her own was finally born to her. Isaac came and, and it was the son of Abraham as, as she had wished. And so God does as God promises. And we, we see that has happened, but the boy was, as the Bible tells us, weaned or three to four years old, somewhere in that range. And Ishmael, who was 13 years older. So he's in his, his mid, mid to late teens. He's making fun of the boy. Um, one way to look at it is he Isaac, Isaac, he laughed at him, right? Or he mocked him or he made fun of him. Sarah took exception to this and the Lord agreed with Sarah's understanding of the situation and determined that uh, Hagar and her son Ishmael would be separated and, and sent off. However, God's promises through Hagar about Ishmael we're honored. He is going to be the father of a great nation, and um, God protects him, even as they had difficulties in their separation with lack of food and water and those kinds of things. God comes to their rescue to make sure that that promise is also kept. Abraham, at this point, has, has his son. He has a pathway to his future descendants that God has promised. But the other major part of the promises land he does not have. Now, you remember he's, we had a short vignette where he's negotiated with one of his neighbors, and he now has a well, water rights, if you will, but it's not land. It's the next best thing, but he, he, that's it. He has water rights. And otherwise, he's just sort of a guest in this land of Canaan where he lives. It's been promised to him. And then you remember we had that very poignant scene where Abraham has his son, Isaac, um, spread out on the altar at God's command, and he goes through the motions of sacrificing his son according to what the Lord, the Lord has required. Now, if you remember, we ended up with me asking you a question. And if you remember, we get this very detailed list of how they arrived at the mountain in Moriah and how they went up the mountain. There were two servants with him. They were left behind at the base. Up the mountain goes Abraham and Isaac. 
And um, they, they took the wood and they took the fire and they took the knife and they took all of this stuff. Up they go. We go through this very excruciating scene of father ready to sacrifice son. Then the ram is found in the bushes and um, down the mountain comes Abraham and the wood and the fire, but not Isaac. Isaac's not mentioned in the coming down off the mountain at the, where I left you last time. Anybody think about that? What that might uh, foreshadow or portend or what that speaks to? Where's Isaac? Anybody have any thoughts, ideas, or anything occur to you? I always assumed he just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to show up later in the story. Yeah. So we, we obviously he must have come down somehow. But after you said that, I thought, well, I wonder if God actually told him to stay. Because he wanted to, to teach him something. I don't know. <laughs> You Isaac foretells uh, a future event. Sacrificing the son. You have the son carrying the wood up the mountain. If that sounds reminiscent of the heavenly father sacrificing his, uh, his one and only son. And if that wood being carried up the mountain sounds suspiciously like the carrying of the cross to that hill outside of Jerusalem. You could begin to wonder if this isn't a foreshadowing. And what if Isaac didn't come down the mountain? What if, in fact, he was sacrificed? What if, in fact, both the ram and Isaac were sacrificed? Is there a foreshadowing of a resurrection here? But God always said they weren't supposed to sacrifice their children. That's right. Um, but God did it himself, didn't he? He sacrificed He's not. Right. So there is nothing that says that Isaac was sacrificed. Right. We have to come. In fact, it explic the text explicitly says that the ram was sacrificed instead of, or some words to that effect, yeah. Isaac. And yet Isaac doesn't come down. So, and Isaac does appear later. Well, we don't know how much later. There's nothing that says he popped up three days later. That makes it perfectly like the resurrection story of Jesus, but he does appear later. So does it begin to plant the seeds of understanding that resurrection is a possibility? Now, in the Old Testament times, nobody knew anything about resurrection. In fact, heaven was at this stage a foreign concept. There was Sheol, the place of shadows, and you just sort of went there after you lived. And it didn't have any definition. It didn't have the things we learned about afterlife that, that have been somewhat revealed to us in the Newer Testament. But once we look back after the cross and we look back at this story, you have to wonder, was God sending us, I hesitate to say, a sign or a signal? Was there some foreshadowing? That's the technical word for this. Uh, that you, you sort of get the idea before the real thing happens. It's interesting in that this is, uh, you could argue whether the Exodus itself or this story of, of the sacrifice of Isaac and then the culmination of Abraham's life is the um, central focal point of the Old Testament. This is certainly the focal point of Genesis. And ex the Exodus story, of course, comes in three other books, not just Exodus itself. But it's interesting to think about that. And, and, and it's I challenge you, as you read in the Older Testament, in all of the stories that you're reading, is, is through what we're seeing with these previous characters, is God's involvement in that, and it's, it's clearly God's work going on. Is it revealing God's own self-thought and what we would call plans? Plans require time, and God stands outside of time, so it doesn't really fit God. But is, is God showing us his intent? his heart, his way of doing things. And has he been doing that all along? Does he do that in your day-to-day -day life? For Abraham, this was real. This was his life, right? Okay. We've got something. Yes, Bob. I just got a quick thought. 
and, and I, I, I don't even know why I'm bringing it up, but on uh, 2219, um, it says, or 18 rather, it says, and in your offspring shall, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The thing I, I, I kind of, I don't mean to say it makes me laugh, but I, I just smile, I guess, is that all throughout we've read so far and looked at it, it's like Abraham gets blessed and he's going to be given everything and God's so happy with him and then all of a sudden he's not, you know, and then he, something else happens and then he goes through the same thing again. He's blessed and he will, his, his future people will be blessed and everything will be great and doing so good and then it almost changes again and then it's, it's like it's a, like a, a wave up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I, 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 I don't know. I just kind of thought that, like after the first time, would be enough. You know, it's like okay, you're given God's blessing, and that should be it. Well, Ab Abraham has been given God's blessing, to be sure. You are given God's blessing in confession and forgiveness. You're given God's blessing through God's word each time we gather on Sunday. But we need it over and over again, do we not? True. Because we we do not walk perfectly in, in Jesus' path. So, so we need that. And, and Abraham, in that sense, looks a bit like us. And I think, you know, so with the beginning of Abraham and going forward in the story, we find characters that look and act like us. They fail like we do, and they succeed as we sometimes do. But in this, in this particular verse you've pointed to, 2218, we're oh, talking about something else. We're talking about the blessing. You're, one of your descendants or your descendants will be a blessing to every nation. And in that, we see truly the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, a direct de a descendant of Abraham that will be a blessing to the whole world as he dies with the sins of the world on his shoulders. So, um, and then that, so that promise will take many generations to fulfill, and it won't be in Abraham's lifetime. Yes, sir. So I guess I'd look at it, my thoughts come from the other side of the story, from the way you talked about it. It's like the people that were there at the resurrection knew of this story and looked at it more like maybe the fulfillment of the covenant of Isaac and Abraham and all that kind of stuff. That's mm -hmm. the thought that strikes me. And I think that's true. But it took some time for that to sink in, too. Because, you know, can you imagine being at the foot of the cross itself? You know, what, what you see and what you absorb in that particular scene is probably not viewed in, in ancient scripture. It's, it's dealt with in the here and now. So it took a good, I mean, the Gospels themselves, the first one we think was written was Mark's, and it probably came 20, 25 years after the crucifixion. So it took a lot of time to process and figure that out and draw connections. And Revelation, um, the book that refers most to the Old Testament witness, has the most connections by far in the New Testament um, corpus. Revelation came, we think, about the year 120, 125 A.D. So, it, you know, it took a lot of time to get there and draw those connections and figure it out. Um, and you have to remember, too, the, New, the Old Testament, as we know, it didn't exist yet. It was just a scroll here and a scroll there. You know, it wasn't put together in a volume like as we carry it into this room. So it took a while for the people to figure all that out. Um, and just the way it does with us, you know, something traumatic happens. We, we see a car accident, say, and we see people get injured and, and we take care of the situation best we can. We help the injured. We tell the cops what we see, that kind of thing. And then, you know, for a night or two or three after that, it all starts rewinding in our head and we begin to rethink it. And what did we see? And, and we, we doubt ourselves and then we correct ourselves and, and, and how that all played out. The same process happened after the crucifixion and the resurrection. It, and it, but it took longer than two or three days. It took two or three lifetimes for people to begin to put it together. And truthfully, we're still doing that. That's what we do in this room. We're still considering what does the Bible mean in light of the resurrection 2,000 years later? And then we don't have all the answers yet. And perhaps we never will. 
Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's see here. I had some things to say. I didn't say yet. Some opening thoughts. <laughs> we know from the verse right before the one Bob pointed to a moment ago that Isaac's future is assured. We know he is going to be the person that brings about all those descendants promised to his father, Abraham. And God's promise is that through Isaac, there's going to be innumerable, uncountable number of descendants. And we heard that promise as well. And so if that's going to happen, Isaac has to have a wife, right? We already know, we think we know that he was in his early 30s when he was laid out on that altar. Still no mention of a wife or anything like that. And uh, as we will see very shortly, many more years have passed by and still Isaac isn't making any progress toward um, having kids. You know, certain things required for that. But one thing is, is very obvious in Genesis. I mean, we start with Adam and Eve and we travel so far through Abraham and Sarah. But in the witness of Genesis, family is paramount. Husband, wife, family. And that becomes later the, the Hebrew and, and still is the Jewish tradition. We want us to think to ourselves that, you know, the Jewish religion, if you will, is all about the temple and the synagogue. And it's not. That's not the center of Judaism. Center of Judaism is expressed in the family, especially in the family meal, sometimes called the Seder you know, or the, and a special Seder called the Passover meal. Yes, there are those other things, but those other things are not the center of the religious expression that we know as Judaism. Christianity comes up out of Judaism. And, and over the centuries, we've focused more on what we do on Sunday or Saturday evening or whenever we gather as a congregation in, in church. And we think of family as somehow the secular part of our lives, the separate part of our lives. We do it over here on those other you know, seven times 20 or yeah, no, seven times 24 minus one hours of our lives. But in truth, that's where we come from, too. I mean, God meets us in family and, and God sends us out to serve one another from that, that family understanding. Um, and, and we see that. I mean, we've seen it again from Adam and Eve through Abraham and Sarah. Now it's time to, to bring that to the next generation with Isaac and a wife to be found for him, which is much of what we'll talk about tonight. So chapter 24 brings Rebecca into view. Um, yes, she spells it differently than we spell it in English, or we're used to seeing it in our, in our culture. And, and that's quite okay. But as we read this story of Rebecca being brought to the family, just Try to unfold in your mind how these things could have happened without God working just behind the text, just out of sight. God's in control of this whole thing. It's amazing to see it unfold. And then wonder how much is God really in control of our lives? Do we see that? Um, does the Lord provide for those things we need even before we know we need them? How is it that I found Jessica or Jessica found me? Be more accurate. How did that happen? It's a crazy story. I'm not going to share it tonight. But when, when I was at the worst circumstance of my life, that's when Jessica walked in. And everything changed for me after that. Everything. Didn't take long. My profession changed. She had me packed up and going to seminary. <laughs> you know, I wasn't an engineer anymore. Um, I... And that started here in Albuquerque. And I didn't think of it in those terms at the time, but now almost 22 years later, ah, I can see it now. Um, but before we get to Rebecca, before we get there, we have to first spend some time with Sarah this evening. And we'll do that first. Let me read these first, or let me read the chapter, which is chapter 23 for us all. Sarah lived 127 years. So Isaac's 37 as we read this, right? Then she died in Kiriat Arba, now known as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. 
Then Abraham got up from his morning, from mourning his dead, and said to the sons of Heth, I am a foreign resident, a temporary settler among you. Grant me ownership of a burial site among you so that I may bury my dead wife. The sons of Heth, or Hittites in your translation it may be, answered Abraham, Listen, sir, you are a mighty prince among us. You may bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse us, refuse you his tomb to prevent you from burying your dead. Abraham got up and bowed down to the local people, the sons of Heth. Then he said to them, if you agree that I may bury my dead, then hear me out. Ask Ephron, the son of Zohar, if he will sell me the cave of Machpelah that belongs to him. It is at the end of his field. Let him sell it to me publicly for the full price, so that I may own it as a burial site. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth. Ephron the Hittite replied to Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth before all who entered the gate of his city, No, my lord, hear me out. I sell you both the field and the cave that is in it. In the presence of my people, I sell it to you. Bury your dead. Abraham bowed before the local people and said to Ephron in their hearing, Hear me, if you will. I pay to you the price of the field. Take it from me so that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear me, my lord. The land is worth 400 pieces of silver. But what is that between me and you? So bury your dead. So Abraham agreed to Ephron's price and weighed out for him the price that Ephron had quoted in the hearing of the sons of Eph, 400 pieces of silver, according to the standard measurement at that time. So Abraham secured Ephron's field in Machpelah, next to Mamre, including the field, the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field and all around its border, as his own property in the presence of the sons of Eph, before all who entered the gate of Ephron's city. After this, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah, next to Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So Abraham secured the field and the cave that was in it as a burial site from the sons of Heth. And so almost as briefly as we encountered the birth of Isaac, we encounter the death of Sarah. It's, uh, she's been a remarkable lady, not perfect by any means, nor was her husband a perfect man. But she and her husband, as a family, were the first people of true faith. We had people before them, to be sure, but they're the first generation of faith. And the man who began his life as Jacob would later be renamed Israel or Israel is to be her grandson. So she's the grandmother of faith, if you want to look at it that way, the grandmother of God's people. And so she deserves a worthy place to be laid to rest. And when your family doesn't own any land in, in that ancient culture, that's a problem. It's a problem. And it drove this whole story. But there's more here than just Abraham going out and finding a good place to lay his life, his wife to rest. There's much more here. And some of it was subtle and, and some of it jumps off the page. But Abraham has been determined since God promised him so long ago. I mean, he's 137 now. He's 10 years older. He's been promised for decades that God is going to give him the land of Canaan. And he has not one piece of dirt he can call his own apart from that well. So he's been determined to do this, and he wants to see that in his lifetime. And it, it's been coming off of the pages as we've come together. And now this piece of land, which is in Canaan, can be his and a place to bury his wife at the same time. So in that sense, God's promise of land now begins to come true in this modest bit of land. Now, how much land is it? We don't exactly know. But, you know, there's a long tradition among human beings that, you know, plots of land were typically there for farmers to be able to raise crops. So you can think of it in terms of something like 
the 40 acre plot that was standard in this continent um, in its earliest days. It, not exactly 40 acres, but something like that, that makes it a far, viable piece of, of farmland. And oh, by the way, it happens to have a cave in the end and it's surrounded by trees. So it's not, it's not a quarter acre lot or smaller like the one I live in, right? It's, it's, it's an appreciable amount of land. And, um, and that has finally happened. But to get there, we had these, it seems to us, protracted back and forth negotiations trying to figure out how he can buy that. And I'll say a bit about that now. Um, there were three stages, if you will, in these negotiations between Abraham and these Hittites. And they're different from the Hittites we come to later, but these sons of Heth. And they happen right in the gate of the city, right? So it's done in the public hearing of everyone. It's done in the place where things are resolved publicly to make them contractually valid. We've seen that with Lot. So now we're seeing that same circumstance here. So they become known and viable and permanent, which is really the big thing in Abraham's mind. So it starts out when he asks just for a burial plot. Right. And th their answers to them are, are, are very generous and immediate. We've got a lot of fine graves we've prepared for ourselves. Take any one you want. Take mine. Say these men standing in the gate. That's pretty impressive. Um, some of you may have prepared your own place to be laid to rest. Anybody willing to give it up to somebody who comes along and needs it? Not a normal human way of responding. But they have great respect for this man, Abraham, who's been their neighbor now for quite some time. And, and, and it's an act of kindness. You know, they not only respect him, maybe they've come to love him, but they know he's grieving. He's grieving deeply and, and they want to help relieve his grief. Give him a grave. We can dig another one. We have time. And then Abraham goes to this one man he knows, Ephron or he calls him out in front of everybody else and says he wants to have that one particular cave that he has his eyes on, this cave in Machpelah. Um, now, Ephron says, well, why the cave only? Why don't you, you know, take the land too? Take the field. Now, I don't know if, if Abraham was planning on that or not. Maybe that took him by surprise, but it took the negotiations to a whole new level when you have the cave and the land. And the problem was that if he was just given the cave and the land, which it appears that, that Ephron was doing at the beginning, then the transaction isn't permanent. You know, when, when Abraham's heirs come along, the next generation or the next or the next, somebody could take the land back perhaps because it's part of a bigger parcel. So just being given the gift was not satisfactory for Abraham. He insisted on buying it. He wanted that public transaction, that contractual arrangement, so that it was his and belongs to his descendants forever. Now, having offered the land with the cave, it's the first part of God's promise, part of Canaan. And he, he wanted to make sure it was secure, it appears. Let's see here. So Ephron names a price, 400 pieces of silver. Now, what I'm reading is that, you know, a, a standard farming plot, you know, in, in ancient times um, was worth far less than 400 pieces of silver. It was, it was a hefty price. But did you notice Abraham he doesn't object in the least? There's no bartering. There's no, ah. You're trying to skin me, 400 people, none of that, none of that. He doesn't quibble in the least and immediately agrees to the price and counts it out right there on the scales in front of everybody in the city gate. 400 pieces of silver requested, 400 pieces of silver delivered to make everything legal and above board. And now that bit of land is unquestionably his and his descendants forever in Hebron. Okay. So finally, this man is able to lay his longtime wife and sister to rest in the cave or grave 
there at uh, the field in Machpelah. And Abraham, with his own eyes and his own lifetime, has now viewed the second part of God's promise begin to come true. He has his descendant, doesn't yet have his descendant descendants, but he has his descendant and a little bit of land, a foothold, a start, a place to begin to grow. And that takes us to the first nine verses of chapter 24. Any, any thoughts about Sarah's death and burial? Anything to impress you that maybe I didn't cover? Anybody at home? When you hear that um, Sarah's 127 and, and she has died, you sort of wonder what's next for Abraham, right? And, and in fact, that's, that's on the horizon. We're getting there. So it's a melancholy night for this couple. Okay, but first, we have to deal with the descendants for Isaac. And let me read the first nine verses of, of chapter 24. And it begins almost the way the last chapter did. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in everything. It almost sounds like Abraham's on his deathbed, doesn't it? Maybe he is. Abraham said to his servant, the senior one in his household, who was in charge of everything he had, put your hand under my thigh so that I may make you solemnly promise by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. You must not acquire a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. You must go instead to my country and to my relatives to find a wife for my son, Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is not willing to come back with me to this land? Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Be careful never to take my son back there, Abraham told him. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and the land of my relatives, promised me with a solemn oath to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you may find a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to come back with you, you will be free from this oath of mine. But you must not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and gave his solemn promise he would carry out his wishes. Three times. God's number, three times, Abraham says, do not take my son out of Canaan and out there. Now, I guess before I, I ask anything, what do you think of Isaac at this point? I mean, let's review what we've been told about Isaac in total. I can do it very briefly. He was born. He was weaned and made fun of, right? He was laid out on an altar when he's in his 30s, and dad was 130-something. And now dad won't let him off the farm, so to speak, even to go look for his own wife. And oh, by the way, this head slave is in charge of everything Abraham has, not Abraham's grown son. What's it tell you about Isaac? That's everything we know about him so far. He's, he's not very capable. Let me put it that way. Okay, dad doesn't trust him to, to leave town. Even with the sermon, somebody on Sunday said, he sounds like he's sort of simple. <laughs> I think that's very polite. But he Keep, sounds spoiled, too. He may be. Dad's rich, and Dad takes care of him to the max. Even, apparently, on Dad's deathbed, Dad's still sheltering him from the world. And maybe it's necessary, or maybe Dad's just that way, and son has grown up that way. We can't quite tell yet. But keep that in mind as we begin to hear more about Isaac and contrast that with what you hear about Rebecca. Okay, again, it starts out with the impression that Abraham's death is near. Uh, those, those first words in that first verse just, again, give you the impression that he's at death's door, and perhaps he is. Um, the seventh verse of uh, uh, verse of uh, chapter 25 where we haven't gotten to yet maybe gives you an impression dad ends up living a good bit longer but that's hard to reconcile 
But here we get the impression that Abraham truly is on his deathbed. And so we don't know how time exactly passes in the, in the carrying out of all these things. By the time this trusted servant, who Abraham has trusted with everything he owns, by the time he comes back with Rebecca, Isaac's going to be the head of household, and Abraham will have passed from the scene. Now, how long does it take to get from the south of Canaan all the way to Syria, do this deed, and come all the way back? That's a bit of an open question. But it's, it's somewhere along there, Abraham will breathe his last. These, you've just heard, are Abraham's final words as recorded in the Bible. Don't let my son out of Canaan. Go find him a wife, but don't take him with you. He must stay here. But it's poignant, isn't it? He is executing God's desires for those future ancestors. He's doing what's necessary to make that happen. Those are his final words as we hear them. Um, and that's befitting of somebody who, for the most part, tried hard to be faithful to the Lord. Yes, he passed his wife off as his sister twice that we know of, and, and he made some other errors along the way. Not a perfect man, as his wife wasn't a perfect woman. But he was faithful, and he has been doing his best to do God's will, um, to a point that you and I, I don't think, would take his place at that altar with our son for example. And this servant is to swear that he's going to find that wife. And this has to happen if those numerous descendants are ever going to occur. There's no other way, right? There must be a wife. There must be. And the wife must not be a Canaanite. We're not told why that is. We hear Abraham say it three times. It'll be much later when we figure that out. But he must come from the people that Abraham came from, at the beginning of his sojourn, where he left uh, the, the, the Chaldeans, the land of the Chaldeans, and came to the place where God would show him. And now he's got to go back and find this wife for, for Isaac in the land of the Chaldeans, among the very same ancestors of Abraham. Um, interesting. She must come from his relatives, from his homeland. Abraham was called by God to go to a place that was not described for him. He took that leap of faith, packed up his wife and everything he had, and left his father and all of his household belongings. You can begin to see what's going to happen for Rebecca. Is she going to be asked to do the very same thing in almost the very same path, starting point and ending point? Is she to be the new Abraham? She must, and this is really cool, because this is going to explode for us in the coming verses. Abraham says, prompted by the Lord, we must assume that this woman must be willing to come to Canaan. Women didn't get a lot of choices in those days. They pretty much did what the men said, according to the paid dowry and the arrangements. But here, this little piece, it's almost a throwaway line at this point. She must be willing to come to Canaan. Watch how that plays out. Anything else strike you before we hear the rest of the story? Yes, Bob? Well, I was just thinking that uh, you said, why not the Canaanite and why Rebecca? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought back to when Abraham was originally told by God that I'm going to bless your people, mm -hmm. your descendants, and I'm going to send you out to to populate and do the carrying my messages, etc. Et right. So to me, that says well, gives me the reason to understand why he would go back and to where she was to get somebody from there and not a Canaanite because she is among his people, right. which is the one God originally chose to go forth and do all this stuff. Yep, that's half the sandwich. And so I'll give you the spoiler alert, which comes much, much later. In fact, it doesn't come until Moses comes along. Um, the other half is, if, if Isaac were to have children with a Canaanite woman, would the children then be Canaanites? 
And if they were, of course, that's the Jewish tradition. They take on the mother's background. That's the, the Hebrew tradition, I should say. If that were the case, then God's prophecy that I will one day drive the Canaanites out of this land. I will destroy the Canaanite culture and replace them with my people. How can that be happening when his people are Canaanites? Yeah. So that's the other half of that piece that comes many generations later. So can't be Canaanite because then the Exodus can't work. 400 years later, or many more than 400 years later. They were in Egypt for 400 years. So all those pieces have to happen. God's plan isn't yet revealed, yet we're able to read it. You know, we've, we've looked at it for 4,000 years almost. And we can work backwards and see how it fits together. Okay, chapter 24, beginning at the 10th verse, and, and a long read this time. This is a, a dear story many of us heard in our childhood, um, but we're going to try to read it with new eyes tonight. Okay, beginning in the 10th verse. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels, 10 of them, and departed with all kinds of gifts from his master at his disposal. He journeyed to the region of Aram Naharim in the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down by the well outside the city. It was evening the time when the women would go out to draw water. He prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, guide me today. Be faithful to my master Abraham. Here I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the people who live in the town are coming out to draw water. I will say to a young woman, please lower your jar so I may drink. May the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac reply, drink, and I'll give your camels water too. In this way, I will know that you have been faithful to my master. Before he had finished praying, there came Rebekah with her water jug on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah. Milcah was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Now, the young woman was very beautiful. We've heard that description before, haven't we? It was the description of Sarah, right? She was a virgin. No man had ever been physically intimate with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came back up. Abraham's servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a sip of water from your jug. Drink, my lord, she replied, and quickly lowering her jug to her hands, she gave him a drink. When she had done so, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have drunk as much as they want. She quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw more water until she had drawn enough for all his camels. Silently, the man watched her with interest to determine if the Lord had made his journey successful or not. After the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a baka and two gold wrist bracelets weighing 10 shekels and gave them to her. Whose daughter are you? He asked. Tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom Milcah bore to Nahor. We have plenty of straw and feed, she added, and room for you to spend the night. Hearing some echoes again here. Echoes of Abraham and his hospitality to those three angels, the three presents of the Lord that came by, and of Lot as well, later. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord, saying, Praise be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his faithful love for my master. The Lord has led me to the house of my master's relatives. The young woman ran and told her mother's household all about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban. Laban rushed out to meet the man at the spring. When he saw the bracelets on his sister's wrists, And the nose ring and heard his sister, Rebecca, say, this is what the man said to me. He went out to meet the man. There he was standing by the camels near the spring. Laban said to him, come, you who are blessed by the Lord. Why are you standing out here when I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So Abraham's servant went into the house and unloaded the camels. Straw and feed were given to the camels, and water was provided so that he and the men who were with him could wash their feet. When food was served, he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. 
tell us, Laban said. I am the servant of Abraham, he began. The Lord has richly blessed my master, and he has become very wealthy. The Lord has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, bore a son to him when she was old, and my master has given him everything he owns. My master made me swear an oath. He said, you must not acquire a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. But you must go to the family of my father and to my relatives to find a wife for my son. But I said to my master, what if the woman does not want to go with me? He answered, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you. He will make your journey a success, and you will find a wife for my son from among my relatives, from my father's family. You will be free from your oath if you go to my relatives, and they will not give her to you. Then you will be free from your oath. When I came to the spring today, I prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you have decided to make my journey successful, may events unfold as follows. Here I am standing by the spring. When the young woman goes out to draw water, I'll say, please give me a little water to drink from your jug. Then she will reply to me, drink, and I'll draw water from your camels too. May that woman be the one whom the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finish praying in my heart, along came Rebecca with her water jug on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. So I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll give your camels water too. So I drank. She also gave the camels water. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She replied, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to Nahor. I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. Then I bowed down and worshiped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right path to find the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show faithful love to my master, tell me. But if not, tell me as well, so that I may go on my way. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, this is the Lord's doing. Our wishes are of no concern. Rebecca stands here before you. Take her and go so that she may become the wife of your master's son, just as the Lord has decided. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then he brought out gold, silver jewelry, and clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave valuable gifts to her brother and to her mother. After this, he and the man who were with him ate a meal and stayed there overnight. When they got up in the morning, he said, let me leave now so I can return to my master. But Rebecca's brother and her mother replied, let the girl stay with us a few more days, perhaps 10. Then she can go. But he said to them, don't detain me. The Lord has granted me success on my journey. Let me leave now so I may return to my master. Then they said, we'll call the girl and find out what she wants to do. So they called Rebecca and asked her, do you want to go with this man? She replied, I want to go. Or in, in the accurate translation, I will. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, accompanied by her female attendant with Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebecca with these words. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. May your descendants possess the strongholds of their enemies. <laughs> then Rebecca and her female servants mounted the camels and rode away with the man. So Abraham's servant took Rebecca and left. Do you hear anything new from the story you remember? Anybody hear anything new? There's more to the story, of course. We'll come to that in a bit. But let's review. Let's review by first focusing on Abraham's servant, not on Rebecca. OK, this guy's as loyal as it comes. I mean, he, he does exactly what his master says. And when his master gives him all these detailed instructions, he's able to repeat those things after being on a camel for I don't know how many miles. <laughs> right. He's he's very loyal and he's very true. And he's constantly calling on the Lord, which impresses me. He's, he's asking the Lord to make these things happen instead of saying, oh, Lord, look what I did. 
It's not that way at all. He's able to walk into his master's family surroundings. Now, they've been separated for, depending on which side of the family, two or three generations. And he walks right in and he's able to speak in front of these people. Put dinner aside for now. Let me talk and tell you what I'm here for. And he just lays it all out. And he does it eloquently and perfectly. And he, word for word, sounded like it was redundant as I read it to you. It seemed like two or three times. But that's a, it's an impressive thing about this man as he's being fueled to do what he's, he's commissioned to do. And in doing so, Rebecca's family is ready to say yes. Now, there's a step missing in the ancient world. There's the dowry, right? You have to negotiate these things. You have to figure out the price. And what we get is this throwaway line. Oh, oh by the way, he gave valuable gifts to her, his brother and mother, or her brother and mother. We, we had the 400 pieces of silver counted out for the, the field just a little while ago. Here, no accounting of the dowry, no negotiating of the dowry. They've already decided, the family has, that Rebecca should go. This is a thing of the Lord. And, and they don't really know this guy. They don't have any memory, I wouldn't expect, of, of Abraham at all. I mean, he left like 85 years ago. And it's not an exaggeration. So they don't have any, any real memory of the man. And then this curious thing, it's all agreed to. And then all of a sudden they say, well, maybe not. Let's think about it. Let's, you know, hang, let her hang around for about, yeah, maybe 10 days. Then you can go. What's that all about? Is there any purpose to that that you discerned? I don't discern any family purpose, but I wonder maybe if, if somebody else thought of it. I just wondered if they thought they'd have more time to renegotiate the dowry. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. I mean, he's got 10 camels loaded up out there. Maybe they get a little more a heftier price. Maybe they wanted to say goodbye. Maybe they wanted to say goodbye. Uh, maybe there was a, an emotional element to this. Maybe there was a God element to this. Remember, this man, the servant says, we must get back there to Canaan. We must go. And, Abek and Rebecca agreed with them. Remember the prophecy? She has to agree to go. Up to this point, she hadn't really been consulted. Now she agrees. And that part of the prophecy happens. And then, you know, they, they turn around and they ask her, you want to go? that doesn't happen in the ancient world. Daughters were treated, I don't want to say as property, but more or less as property. I've got the dowry, you've got the daughter, have a nice day, you know? And then daughter didn't have anything to say about it. Here, the family gives her the ability to say whether she will or will not. Now we've got the ring in the mouth. Well, that's the sign of, <laughs> sign of betrothal, right? She's got the ring. She's got the bracelets. Um, you know, there's, there's a claim upon her. It appears that that would be the ancient meaning here. And um, then she gets all this fancy clothing to go and, and some more about that later. But notice that this man is, is a, a man of prayer, right? Did you catch that part? When he gets to the well, right? He's, he's saying, okay, God, I need you to show me who it is I'm supposed to get. And, and oh, by the way, it has to be somebody out of Abraham's family, you know, How, and I don't even know what they look like. So what if God, you know, there's, there's a, a woman who comes and will give me a drink of water and my camels too. Can that be the one? And before he's finished praying, that's what he gets. It's exactly what he gets. So he doesn't rely on his own abilities. He's not interviewing the locals. He's not going to the, um, I wanted to say watering holes, but that would be the wrong thing to say. He doesn't go to the local hangouts, right, and, and try to find out who the eligible women are. He just lets God direct the whole thing through a prayerful relationship with God. And, oh, Lord, give me success today. And poof, there she is, right? The thing that really strikes me is how Abraham's faith in God became his faith in God. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And then you wonder why Abraham put everything under this man's care? 
I mean, you're seeing the evidence of that in, in all that you say. So his, his, this man's prayer is answered. Even he was he told us twice. He was still praying. He wasn't finished and it was being answered. So God was ready. And again, you, you can see God's hand in these things. These things are happening before the human characters do anything other than arrive. Um, and oh, by the way, not only did she fit all the qualifications of living in the right place and, and being beautiful and being single and, and, you know, having virgin qualities and all that kind of stuff comes from Abraham's own family. Uh, what are the odds, right? What are the odds unless God's hand is involved? Um, remember every time Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister, he, he got in trouble, but he ended up getting richer and leaving town. And we, how come he keeps getting richer? Well, come to this stage of Abraham's life and 400 pieces of silver are needed for a grave. We don't quibble about that. We just take care of it. It's not, a, it's not a matter of concern. The matter of concern is about a place for Sarah and the, and the covenant with the Lord. <clears throat> Send the servant off. He's got 10 camels loaded down with dowry stuff. Don't worry about that. It's more than enough. I mean, probably one camel load was more than enough, but he said 10. He, money was not an object with him. Money was not a constriction for Abraham. It wasn't a reason to say no. It was a way to say yes. And God had provided that. And oh, by the way, it's also provided everything necessary to take care of that son back home. It's going to need taken care of after dad's gone. Spoiled or simple or both. He's going to need taken care of. And, and the means are provided by all of these things that have come into Abraham's possession over the years. Um, and I've gotten ahead of myself, but there he is. You know, we're seeing what, what God had in mind with those valuable things that came into Abraham's possession. Um, and, and therefore, those future descendants now become possible. Now, let's talk about Rebecca. Talk about somebody who's impressive. You know, I talked to you before about what we know about Isaac. It's a short list. It still hasn't changed. We've read a lot of text and heard any more about Isaac. But in this chapter, we've heard a lot about Rebecca. Yes, she comes from Abraham's family. That's a plus. She is beautiful. She's a virgin. Mention those things. Energetic. Yes, she gives the man a drink. This man has come from Canaan all the way up into the you know, northern part of modern Syria. He's got 10 camels who probably haven't drunk anything on that trip. And, ten, and by the way, a thirsty camel can drink a lot. This lady carries enough for all 10 of them to drink their fill. I probably couldn't drag enough water for one camel. Maybe some of you could do too. But 10? Pretty darn impressive. She has the Abrahamic gift of hospitality. And in her, she comes from a family that shares that view. And we see them as they bring this stranger into their home, put straw under their camels and, and give him a place to be for the night and a meal. Um, and she's a woman of faith. How does she know this faith? We don't know unless God is, is working through her, but she's a woman of faith. She's willing to take this leap. She's willing to say, I will, when asked to go to a strange place to marry a man she's never seen and knows nothing of this man other than what his servant just announced in the living room. Nothing. She's ready to go. Um, remember Abraham's call? I mean, the Lord is speaking through this servant, it would appear. And the call is the same as the one given to Abraham all those many years ago. Go to a land I will show you. And I will give you many descendants and a fine place to live. That's pretty much what's promised to her. And she's willing to become betrothed, even though the size of the dowry is irrelevant to her. She doesn't get a nickel of that. That goes to her relatives. And she gets some nice clothes to wear on the trip, some jewelry, but that's it. 
She's just willing and ready to go without any real compensation. There's nothing in it for her except a new life that's unknown. God's, God's in charge. He's working on Rebecca's heart, but he's working through all of these events that, that come to pass. So look at verse 21. The servant waits for the Lord's approval that this is the right woman, Rebecca. Look at verse 27. The Lord led this servant right to Abraham's family home, which is where he was supposed to go. And he never asked for directions. No signposts, no neighbors, no nothing. He went there. And then in verse 40, it's as plain as it can be. God has sent an angel to accompany this servant on the mission. We didn't hear that the angel did anything specifically, except all these things kept happening. And the angel was there. The presence of the Lord was there. And then in verse 50, we see that Laban and Bethuel acknowledge that they understand God is at work. If they can see it, can you? Can the readers of this story see God at work in all of this? And then in 41, it's something of a surprise in that we've long since forgot, you shall get a wife for my son, from my kindred, from my father's house. And that's exactly who Rebecca is. It's not just a distant relative. It comes directly, direct descendant from Abraham's own father. It's, it's all carried out by God. All of it. So two questions to consider. Why didn't Isaac go there and do this or go with the servant to do this? Why was Isaac left home? Remember him? <laughs> he seems like he's just barely in the story, right? But he's, you know, he might be in his 50s at this point. He's not a kid. And why did Abraham insist that Isaac not leave Canaan? And, and that Bob and I talked about that earlier. And uh, can't. In a sense, we found out why we can't have a wife from Canaan, but why can't Isaac leave Canaan? Well, considering what we know now about Laban, <laughs> who says he would have let him come back? Yeah. Um, I mean, he was a very devious person. But maybe dad just can't let him wander. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe there's doesn't want Isaac messing up God's plan either. Uh, there's that possibility. Because <laughs> then we'd really laugh. So let's let's see if we get a key here as, as we look at another five verses, starting at verse 62, or six verses. Uh, where did I leave? There I am. Now Isaac came from, Be <laughs> here we come finally to Isaac. Now Isaac came from Be'er Lahoy Roy, for he was living in the Negev. That's way down in the south of, of Canaan. He went out to, and here's an interesting word. It may say walk in your translation. It may say relax in my translation. The word in the Hebrew is very uncertain. But he went out to do something in the field in the early evening. Then he looked up and saw that there were camels approaching. Rebecca looked up and saw Isaac. She, here's another uncertain Hebrew word, got down from her camel and asked Abraham's servant, who is that man walk, doing whatever he's doing in the field um, coming toward us? That is my master, the servant replied. So she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac everything that had happened. Then Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent. He took her as his wife and loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The new Sarah, in a sense, is in place. Right? That word relax or walk, as I say, is... is in the Hebrew, very uncertain. We, it's so ancient, we don't really know what it means. But the research of, of my Hebrew mentor, um, Dr. Brooke Schramm, um, seeks to answer the question, what was Isaac doing in that field as it was getting dark? What was he doing? And uh, that word that says slip down or, and, and got down as Rebecca dismounted from her camel is also uncertain. Brooke Schramm, good man, <laughs> says he, she fell off her camel laughing <laughs> is the way he takes that uncertainty. <laughs> now, if she sees him out in the field and she's laughing, what was he doing in that field? Your imagination takes over. <laughs> Nobody knows. Okay. 
But that's just how they end. Again, his name means he laughs. But again, we're beginning to scratch our head. Is why can't he leave Canaan? He can't walk in the field, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting little vignette. This is their introduction to one another. But two things are now known. Abraham is no longer with us as we read this. So some things come out of order, but he is the master of the household. That's the way he is described to Rebecca, meaning Abraham no longer is. And she's the new matriarch. She is the new head of the household. We heard those words. She was brought to his mother's tent. I mean, the question in my mind is, is, is she the new Sarah or is she the new Abraham? I mean, in the, in the previous generation, Abraham was sort of the dominant character. Most of the stories revived or revolved around him. Um, Sarah was very important. Here, we know already much more about Rebecca and her character and her abilities than we've known about Isaac. And he's been around for a long time. So maybe she's the dominant character. And, and I think we're going to see that in the weeks coming forward. And what does that tell us about God? Does, does God have a gender preference that only men can be in charge of things in his world? Maybe not. In fact, definitely not. Um, oh, and in verse 2558, you notice translation, if it's a good one, will say, she said, I will, when asked if she would go. And in the Lutheran marriages, we don't say, I do. We say, I will. Guess where it comes from? Yeah, it's a biblical tradition. Um, in verse 60, Rebecca receives uh, an echo. This little poem that her family announces as she's leaving sounds suspiciously like what Abraham was promised. Come back to me. Um, let's see here. Verse 60. Thank you. Verse 60. Yes, there it is buried. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. You know, mother of millions. Oh, many descendants. It's Abraham's promise. May your descendants possess the strongholds of their enemies. That is, may they take their lands and take it. Well, there's the promise of land. So this promise given to Rebecca sounds like the promise given to Abraham. And so we're beginning to see the new cycle with her in the Abrahamic role. That's my assertion anyway. Um, and how come Isaac didn't get that blessing? We're going to have other stories about Isaac and blessings later. But why didn't Isaac receive that blessing from his father in our hearing? Rebecca received it, not Isaac. And let's look at just a few more verses here this evening. The first six verses of chapter 25. Mine is headline, The Death of Abraham. Abraham had taken another wife named Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak and Shuah. Joksan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. The descendants of Dedan were Asherites, Letsherites, and, Lem and Lemites, Lumites, I'm sorry. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epur, Hanok, Abida, and Eldah. All these were descendants of Keturah. Everything he owned, Abraham left to his son Isaac. But while he was still alive, Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them off to the east, away from his son Isaac. So what we have here in these few verses are a flashback. But to where? At what time? We don't know. Does this go all the way back to the time of Hagar and Ishmael? Maybe. Maybe even before. But this is offered up as part of the reality of Abraham's life. Yes, he had concubines and he had other children as it, as it happens. Um, but what's important here uh, that we take from it is that he took responsibility for these as he did with Ishmael. He made sure he was generous in giving all of these gifts and that they were well cared for. However, they were sent away from Isaac so that Isaac would be the the, the descendant who would inherit all of the land and the holdings of the family and the others would not, they would have their gifts. And so things are set up going forward. And so God's plan, even though Abraham had 
Whenever it had occurred, even though Abraham had these other things going on in his life, God's plan was not deterred by that. And finally, the last verses I'll share with you this evening, the epitaph for Abraham, beginning in verse 7. Abraham lived a total of 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age. An old man who had lived a full life, he joined his ancestors. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite. This was the field Abraham had purchased from the sons of Eth. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac. Isaac lived near Beer Lahoi Roy. And so that which we anticipated has come with a twist. You've heard the last now of Abraham. Now, again, this may well be a flashback to the time when the servant was still traveling with Rebecca. He was gathered to his ancestors or gathered to his people. I don't know that I'll ever have a headstone, you know, because I'll probably be cremated and put somewhere else. But if I had a headstone, I think that's what I'd want it to say. You know, gathered, and it happens again. It's going to be the epitaph for Moses as well, and a few other times in the Elder Testament. It's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. And there wasn't any concept of heaven when this was written. And yet, here it is. Um, being gathered doesn't refer to being in the same grave as your wife, as was the case physically on earth here. It was that somehow this thing we later called a soul was being reunited with the ones who had gone before you that you loved. A sentiment that we still hold dear to and has been fostered in the newer Testament. But already the concept existed in Genesis, although not recognized as such for a long, long time after it was given to us. You notice who buried Abraham? Where did Ishmael come from? I mean, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> he didn't have a cell phone to get the notification, no. right? <laughs> or anything like it. How did he know? How did he come in a timely fashion? How was he, he there? Um, he, do you remember what his name means? He hears. Did God tell him? Did he hear? I mean, his name didn't make any sense when he was named at birth, but we keep finding God hearing him when he cried out in the bush, when he was dying of, of thirst and starvation. And did God hear him or did he hear, he hear God and come at the right time? But yes, both of his sons come to bury him in Machpelah. Um, and, and we're not told how Ishmael knows, but God's hand has been in this story with Rebecca and all these other things right on through. We have to, we have to take that leap of faith ourselves that God was involved in this. And so now we lay Abraham and Sarah to rest. Their work is done. And things turn to Rebecca and Isaac. And I deliberately put their words in that order or their names in that order because she will be the prime driver in the story going forward. And he's just along for the ride, more or less. And I keep making fun of Isaac, but I've, I've been doing that for decades. <laughs> okay. Um, think about that. Think about gender roles and, and all that you've been raised to think about them. Males do this and females do that. In the Old Testament, we never break those roles. And as you consider Rebecca, ask yourself, how valid were those understandings that we all grew up with? And was God really doing something else all along that people like me, pastors who were male and stood in front of con congregations, just simply didn't mention. But see what you see if I'm full of soup, or see if you know, see if you see the same thing. See if you don't see God acting through a woman in the lead role. And it won't be the only time in the Old Testament, in my view. Um, not at all. But take a look at that. Um, and then take a look, you know in the text that comes up where we left off and, and into chapter 28. Yeah. I probably finish around nine. Any, any thoughts, questions, or what are you talking about? Pastor sort of questions. I befuddled everybody. Have I?
<laughs> All right. Well, we will meet the next two uh, Sundays or Wednesdays, as is your preference. Um, and we will have our 13th and 14th installments, and that will be the end of uh, that will be where we end up before our summer break. And again, on June 5th and 6th, and apologies for misspelling Pastor uh, Carol's name <laughs> the last several weeks. Got it right this time. Um, remember that on that, that weekend of June 5th and 6th, she's going to preach all four services. And on Sunday, the 6th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, there'll be a big reception for her that starts in the sanctuary and, and will move into Fellowship Hall. So it'll be presentations and reception at 2 o'clock on Sunday. So hope, hopefully you can make that and celebrate her ministry among us. All right. Let us pray once again. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together and showing us your faithful people in their travels and in their deaths. And Lord God, thank you for showing us that you surprise us and the people you choose to do your bidding to make your world as you intend it to be. You pick Rebecca someone we didn't see coming in the way she truly is. And you pick Isaac, somebody perhaps who no one would have seen coming, given the way he appears to be. Lord God, pick us, choose us to change this world to be a more just place, a place where those who are hungry are fed, those who are naked are clothed, and those who are imprisoned know that they're cared for. Lord God, May the intent of Jesus Christ, the calling of the Great Commission, be ours. May we go forth, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. And Do thank you for know coming. where the grave is? Machpelah. There is a, um, a, a series of religious buildings built on this site that is reputed to be the place, as is much often the case. But I say series of sites because they build, they build a place and then it gets knocked down, destroyed, or just built on top of. And so you have these layers of, of temple-like structures on top of each other. Um, but my, my understanding is we don't really know. Yeah, a lot of these places we don't really know. We can't dig down and find the relics. It's very much like the um, the area of the the place where Jesus was born, except at 2000, almost 2,000 years. And it gets even harder. It, it's strange. It's such a small part of the world. I mean, by small, I mean, it's bordered by desert and sea. There's, there's not a lot of space, but so much happens there. And, and yet we can't find exactly where much of it happened at all. I didn't know if Hebron was... I mean, is Hebron, is that the name today? Yes. And is that a big place? Do you know yes, it is a big it's place. Big. It's a big city. It's a cosmopolitan city oh, now. Wow. now. You couldn't have cosmopolitan cities then. Right. Because, you know, you, you didn't have sewage. You didn't have water delivery. You didn't have garbage disposal. And you had to get all the crops in to feed everybody. And right. You didn't have transportation. So cities that were large have very different definition of large than, say, Albuquerque or something bigger oh, sure. in our experience. It just yeah. it physically couldn't occur. Yeah. The Romans began inventing aqueducts and stuff like that, and things got bigger later. Remember when Pastor Carol had a class? Remember it had showed toilets? Mm -hmm. They were like yeah. Roman toilets? Right. Oh, yeah. Very elaborate. <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, Been there. but that's that's two thousand years after this instantiation. Good night, everybody at home. It's been my joy.